there was a young soldier. A young soldier got on a train with one of his officers. And the only available seat, the only available seats were across from an attractive young lady who was traveling with her grandmother. Now, as the four engaged in conversation, the soldier and the young lady kept eyeing one another. There was an, uh, an obvious mutual attraction between these two. And suddenly the train went into a tunnel, sending the train car into peach black darkness. Immediately, two sounds were heard. The smack of a kiss, followed by a whack of a slap across someone's face. And this, remember, this is still in the, the tunnel. It was pitch black. The grandmother thought, I can believe he kissed my granddaughter, but I am glad she gave him the slap he deserves. The commanding officer thought, I don't blame the boy for kissing the girl, but it's a shame that she missed him and hit me instead. <laughs> the young girl thought, I'm glad he kissed me, but I wished my grandmother hadn't slapped him for doing it. And as the train broke into the sunlight, the soldier couldn't help but smile. He had managed to kiss a pretty girl and slap his commanding officer and get away with both. <clears throat> now, John chapter 3, verse 19. The gist of it, it's hard to get away with anything in the light. It is difficult to get away with anything in the light. But that's why so many people love the darkness. Now, this morning we'll be browsing through Sunday as it is written in the New Testament, and we'll uh, review and remind ourselves of why we choose to worship on Sunday, on Sabbath, and do not choose to worship on Sunday as a sacred day of worship. There are many people that love to dwell in darkness. Many know and have seen the evidence in God's word about the true day of worship and the false day of worship, but they choose to follow the false day of worship. Now, there are eight references. There are eight references in the New Testament to the first day of the week, and one, a reference to the Lord's Day. Now, because serious claims for Sunday sacredness have been based upon this text, they call for careful examination and I will put up these texts so that we can see. And this is basically all the text in the whole entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. These are the only eight verses that you will find that, uh, that speak very closely to Sunday as a, arguably, as, as people argue, that it is a sacred day. Now, let me turn my remote on. All right. This is on. Let's look at the first text. This is Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. That's the first Bible verse. Now, this passage states that in the early hours of the day, of the first day of the week, 
After the Sabbath, the friends of Jesus came to visit his tomb. However, no sacred title is given here to the first day. No suggestion of sacredness, sacredness is attached to it, nor is there any command for its observance. A right, um, couple of Sabbaths ago, we were looking, we were reviewing about the Sabbath, the day of God, that God wanted us to remember him as our creator. Today, we're looking at Sunday as the first day of the week. Here, we're arguing that Sunday is not the sacred day that many people, millions of people, think it is a sacred day. All right, so that is the first Bible text. We'll move through this text pretty fast. The second text is Mark chapter 16, verse 2. This also is a straightforward historical narrative. Very early on Sunday morning, just as sunrise, they went to the tomb. Now, this is not a command. Mark records the same visit to the tomb as Matthew chapter 28 that we just read, verse 1, using slightly different words. You following along? All right. Now let's look at the third text. Mark chapter 16, verse 9. After Jesus rose from the dead early on Sunday morning, the first person who saw him was Mary Magdalene, the woman from whom he had cast out seven demons. Now, this too is a simple statement of fact, recording the resurrection of Jesus and his appearance to Mary Magdalene. Somehow, every time I read this and think about this lady, it always surprises me that of everyone, it was Mary, this lady, who decided to run to the tomb and check. That is the third text. Let's look at the fourth text. That is Luke chapter 24, verse 1. This passage adds little to the above, except that it explains the object of the disciples' visit to the tomb. Right? Namely, to anoint the body of Jesus and obviously, they expected to find him dead. Let me read the text. But very early on Sunday morning, the woman went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. Now, usually, in that culture, as soon as the person dies, right, uh, in the process of embalming, they put the spices on, on, the, on the dead person's body, and they wrap him up, and they put him in the tomb and lock him for good. But because in Jesus' situation, the sun was setting very fast on, on Friday evening, and they don't have time to do all that. It was a, it's a long process. So they had to put Jesus in the tomb and remember to come back on Sunday and put the spices on his body after the Sabbath. All right. Let's look at the fifth text. John chapter 20, verse 1. This verse also describes Mary's visit and her discovery that the tomb was open. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. Now, obviously, these, five, these first five scriptures need not detain us long in our search for New Testament evidence for Sunday sacredness. Now, they simply record the fact that Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week and that his empty tomb was visited by several of his disciples the early morning of that day. How many of you have come across people, fellow brothers and sisters, Christians, who, who argue that the Sabbath has been changed to the first day of the week and you are afraid to say anything about it because you don't know the, the specific Bible verses to quote and all that. Now, we're looking at the evidence. There are only eight Bible verses that speaks to this. 
to the first day of the week, and we are going through right, right through it now. After we'll going through this, you would have seen every Bible verses that speaks to the seventh, to the first day of the week or Sunday that is present in the Bible. Now, let's go back to a text. These passages record no divine example of first day observance. They contain no divine command for such an observance. They apply no sacred title to the first day, nor do they give any reason for its observance. On the other hand, they show that Christ's disciple treated the first day as a common working day, for they were prepared to embalm his body on the first day, a task which they declined to perform on the Sabbath. Hope that is clear. All right, remember, this is a re just a review. I know that even those of us who have been in the church for a long time need to review our, the teachings of the Bible so that we are on point. All right, let's look at the sixth text. John chapter 20, verse 19. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. I remember that must be a, I imagine that must be a, can be a scary situation. Can you imagine uh, coming home to a dead loved one standing on the, on the front door? Now, while this passage records a gathering of Christ's disciples on the evening of the resurrection day, it also explains the reason why they were assembled behind the closed doors. For the fear of the Jews. Their motives were unbelief, fear, not faith or devotion. Some have suggested that the disciples were gathered together to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. But Mark chapter 16 verse 14 and Luke chapter 24 verse 41 shows that most of the disciples remain in a state of gloomy unbelief in the resurrection right up until the evening of that day. The seventh text, Acts chapter 20 verse 7. On the first day of the week, we gathered with the local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. Paul was preaching to them, and since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking until midnight. Now, this is a, this, we're getting to the, to the important part of this whole discussion between observing the Sabbath as a day, as a holy day, and observing Sunday. Many Sunday keepers or Sunday worshipers would argue and they would quote this Bible verse. Now let's explain a little bit about this Bible verse. I thought it pretty much explains itself. Now this verse records the one isolated meeting of one small town congregation of Christians on the first day of the week. However, the context shows that it was a special meeting called for the purpose of farewelling Paul. It was also a unique occasion because due partly to the accidental death of a young man in the congregation and his miraculous restoration, the meeting continued all night. Now, I will ask you to pull your Bibles out. Open your Bibles, please. And turn with me to Acts chapter 20. In your Bibles, please turn with me to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 8 through 12. You will find this story. And if you have your Bibles with you, please follow with me. I don't know what translation you have. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Acts chapter 20, verse 8, all the way through 12. All right. 
Let me read. There were, verse 8, there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. And in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down, fell on him, and embracing him said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. Now when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten, and talked a long while, even till daybreak, he departed. And they brought the young men in alive, and they were not a little comforted. Wouldn't something like that keep you up all night, you think? Yeah. Now, there is no evidence here that these or any other Christian congregation met regularly for worship on the first day of the week. There is no evidence that these or any other Christians devoted the whole of each first day to religious exercises. The text shows rather that all night meeting was followed not by a days of rest or worship, but by common everyday activities. They woke up on Sunday morning. After that, that night, Monday morning, they went back to their regular work. Now, as a matter of fact, it is impossible to prove from this text that the communion service was celebrated on this occasion. As some people would argue that there was a communion and the breaking of bread. Now, there is no mention of the wine under the term the breaking of bread is frequently applied in the New Testament to uh, just a common meal, a regular meal. I hope you're still awake. Are you awake? Yes. Amen. Now, so to find these verses and evidence for Sunday sacredness, we have to read into them a great deal that is not there. A lot of exaggeration. Besides the meeting described began somewhere before midnight, either on what we now call Saturday night or Sunday night. If it was Saturday night, the meeting began hours before our modern Sunday. If it was Sunday night, the meeting continued for hours after our modern Sunday until daybreak on Monday morning. Nowhere does the Bible suggest that the conducting of one isolated religious meeting on a certain day, apart from any divine act of sanctification, makes that day a Sabbath or a regular weekly day of worship. If the mere holding of a religious meeting automatically sanctified by a day, a day, then every day in the week would qualify as the Sabbath. Excuse me. <clears throat> Let's look at our eighth verse, our eighth text. Oh, six, seven, eight. All right. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter sixteen, verse two. On the first day of each week, you should each. Put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. Now, in spite, in spite of a widespread misunderstanding, this passage does not refer to public giving of offerings in regular church services on Sundays. The advice let every one of you lay by him in store refers rather to the private laying aside of sums of money at home by individuals for a special Judean relief appeal. They were fundraising. These sums would presently be collected by Paul or his 
assistance on their way to Jerusalem. There is no reference here that this public offering would support the local ministry or for foreign missions as we think of them today. Nor is there any reference here that any universal or permanent Christian institutions or to any universal permanent Christian institution for a pattern of worship. Paul is certainly not trying to legislate for the whole church or for the entire Christian age. Now, to use this text as proof of regular Sunday keeping by all the early Christians or as legislation for Sunday observance by all future Christians in all lands for all time is to go far beyond the evidence contained in the text. So people have to be exaggerating if they want to use this text to support their argument that Sunday was a Sabbath was changed to Sunday for observance or to be sacred. Now, this exhausts the eight New Testament references to the first day of the week. That is the eight Bible verses. Don't you think, church, that that is pretty much straightforward? That is straightforward Bible verses. Now, there is a, nine, a ninth Bible verse. It's Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. <clears throat> this passage refers to a literal person. John, who a literal place, the Isle of Patmos, a literal condition in the spirit, and a literal time, the Lord's day. And let me read the, the, the verse. Let us read the verse. It was the Lord's day, and I was worshiping in the spirit. Suddenly I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. Now, this text proves beyond question that in the Christian age, God still has a day which he claims as his own. That is very important. Because there's a lot of teachings, a lot of pressure coming up today in the Christian realm that you can pretty much just worship on any day. That all this Sabbath stuff is all gone. All this Sunday stuff is all gone. You can just pretty much worship him any way you like, any how you like, any day you want. The Bible doesn't agree with that. Nor is it safe for us to guess which day of the week it is. The Bible alone must be allowed to decide this question. To discover which day of the week God claims as his own, we must turn to the other scriptures, such as Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through 11. We have Isaiah chapter 58, verse 13 and 14. We have Bible verses or scriptures like Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12 and verse 20, and so on and so forth. These passages show that the only day of the week which the Lord has ever claimed as his special property is the seventh day. Reaffirmed, reaffirming that this morning. If we are resolved to let the Bible and the Bible only to settle this question, then the Sabbath alone qualifies as the true Lord's day. then that would mean that you are worshiping on the right day that God intended or wanted us to worship in. Coming to a close, we've looked at these verses, these nine texts, and seen the evidence that points only to the Sabbath as the day of worship. Now, is it a surprise that many millions of people follow Sunday or false day of worship other than the Sabbath? No, it's not a surprise. 
throughout history, throughout the records of the Bible, God has always had a small group of people that uphold and obey his commands, his word, that follow him. Satan has always been successful to deceive many people. This is why God has called us to witness. And that brings upon our shoulders a certain pressure, a certain responsibility, a certain weight. I was talking to my friend on, thir on Wednesday, I believe, Wednesday or Thursday. This friend of mine had just um, went and joined, he's a pastor from Fiji, he was called to go and run one of the meetings that was scheduled in Papua New Guinea down in the South Pacific Division in the last month, or the last couple of weeks. And I was asking him how, was, how that was, because I was hearing and looking at some statistics of the, that evangelistic meeting. And he said, yeah, I have never experienced, I have never seen anything like it. There are nine million some people in the population of that island of Papua New Guinea. And according to their records in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, there was three some million people that attended the evangelistic meeting. And to this point, that they're still counting. They have counted over 300 some thousand people already baptized from that baptism from that evangelistic meetings that were held everywhere across the, that island. And a friend of mine was, was telling me that there are some churches. Uh, one of the, the district that he went to preach in uh, had no Adventists whatsoever. There was a lot of people that just don't know who God is. And the district or the, the churches that were closer to that area that they were targeting to do to run the evangelistic me meeting at decided that they were going to, for the last four years, from I think from 2020, that was COVID year, all the way to this year, they were going to go ahead and build a church. Build a church, work and pray and hope that when the baptism comes, they will be able to fill that church. And that was what they did. They did all the lay work, the layman work, and they, pre they did the evangelistic meeting and they were able to baptize 160 something people. And so now they began a, a church. And there were records of other churches that now have found the truth about the Sabbath day that God baptized from the pastor to all of the church members. They baptized them on the Sabbath and they turn up on Sunday and they strip down the, the names on their, of their former church and they put up Seventh-day Adventist church outside. There was a couple of churches like that. Amen? God is using his people and his spirit is moving across the planet. We have to pray that his spirit will move in our hearts so that we too will witness to the people that surround us. That our people here, our relatives, will know that he is coming soon. That they will see the signs that the Bible has been foretelling for over a thousand years. That they are fulfilling. We now have positive proof had no place whatever in the example of or teaching of Jesus, nor was it part of the faith once delivered unto the saints. The time-honored custom of Sunday observance of therefore revealed here to have no scriptural foundation. There is no scriptural foundation about what, what Sunday is or Sunday worshiping. The only foundation it has ever had is tradition which is another name for the commandments of men. You can find that in Matthew 
chapter 15. Let's see. Matthew chapter 15, verse 6 and 9. In this way, you say they don't need to honor their parents, and so they cancel the word of God for the sake of your own traditions. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. This has been happening for many, many years, over a thousand years. Men following man-made traditions. Now, this conclusion has always, have always challenged Sunday keepers. Many struggle to relate to it because they have always kept Sunday as a day of worship and followed that tradition because their parents and grandparents have always done it. For those of us who were raised in families who worshiped on Sunday, you will understand. I don't, I don't claim to understand that because I was raised an Adventist. But I have always had a lot of respect for individuals who were raised in other denomination and make the decision to follow God's word and the Sabbath. That is a lot of pressure to turn your backs on when it comes to family, traditions. It takes a lot of faith. But the fact that remains true is God's word is truth and it will always be absolute. Amen? Amen. Nothing can change God's word. No man-made tradition can ever make truth untruthful. And let's consider the direct and powerful statement that Jesus made in Matthew chapter 12 verse 30. That's what Jesus said. He who is not with me is against me. I have always found these texts somewhat scary. The thought of not being on Jesus' side, not being on God's side, being on his opposite side. He that is not with me is against me. The only safe position, church family, is to stand where Jesus stands on this question. It is always safe to follow where Jesus leads the way. Amen? Now, once upon a time, a little candle stood in a room filled with other candles. Most of them much larger and much more beautiful than she was. Some were ornate and some were rather simple like herself. Some were white, some were blue, some were pink, some were green. She had no idea why she was there and the other candles made her feel rather small and insignificant. When the sun went down and the room began to get dark, she noticed a large man walking toward her with a ball of fire on a stick. She suddenly realized that the man was going to set her on fire. No, no, she cried. Ah, don't burn me, please. But she knew that she could not be heard and prepared to, for the pain that would surely follow. To her surprise, the room filled with light. She wondered where it came from since the man had extinguished his little stick. To her delight, she realized that the light was coming from her. Then the man struck another fire stick and one by one lit the other candles in the room. Each one gave out the same light that she did. During the few hours, she noticed that slowly her wax began to flow. She became aware that she would soon die. With this realization came a sense of why she had been created. Perhaps my purpose on earth is to give out light until I die. She mused, and that's exactly 
what she did. God created you and I to produce light in a dark world. Like that little candle, we all can produce the same amount of light. We are different color, shape, sizes. But our purpose is to give a light. And that is simply why we are gathered here in the sanctuary today, is to give light and glory to God. And when you are walking around, think about yourself. Imagine yourself. I am a light. And when I am walking around, now this is where the heavy responsibility comes on. When I am walking around, I don't represent myself. Many times, it is tempting. We live in a free country, right? We tend to argue, well, I can do whatever I want. Well, think about it again. You have hid the call of Jesus Christ. You are not yours, you are Christ. The weight of responsibility falls on me when I am walking around, I have to know that everyone who's looking behind me should see Jesus. I am a reflection of Jesus. And that is a lot of, of, of pressure. But once again, God, Jesus, gives me and you the, the strength to do that. We cannot produce light until we receive it from an outside source. That source is Jesus Christ, the light of the world. You know, sometimes we can be afraid or intimidated. The pressure that this world puts on us as Christians, especially nowadays, and I believe according to the word of God, is the pre this pressure is gonna get tougher. It's gonna get stronger. And there are times when you just wanna take that candle of yours and hide. Sometimes it'll make you feel like there's a big crowd, you just wanna walk in. Make yourself as short as you can so that no one else sees you and just blend right into the crowd. Well, that is not the call. The call to you and me is to be this candle. As small as you are, you have to shine so that everyone will know that you reflect, that you are shining Jesus' light. John chapter 8, verse 12, our last Bible verse. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Amen? That is the strength. As human beings, we don't have the strength, my dear church family. Our source of strength is Jesus. You're constantly refueling that, that gasoline of Jesus to fuel you so that you can, may not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. It is my prayer that God will bless each and every one of us this beautiful Sabbath morning. Please close your eyes and bow your head for a word of prayer. To the most holy place in heaven, our gracious Father, we humbly bow before your throne, Father. We thank you for your counsel. We thank you for reminding us of the truth of your word. Father, sometimes your word can be so sharp that it cuts deep into our souls. It teaches us to be humble. And we thank you, Father. We thank you that you have reminded us today that we are on the right spot that you have anointed Saturday to be a day of worship, to show our reverence and our allegiance and our obedience to you. Father, we ask, I ask for the strength that you will continue to put in our hearts, in your people that are seated in the sanctuary this morning, that you will put that strength in their hearts so that their candles will continue to burn and that they will continue to be your ambassadors and your light. 
Teach us, Father. We open our hearts to you. In Jesus' worthy name we pray. Amen.